Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Duncan Sparrow, a member of the Borderless Cyber Program Committee. I'd like to thank the Council of ISACs and OASIS for co-hosting Borderless Cyber. It's my honor and pleasure to introduce Josh Corman. I don't want to use up all his time extolling his virtues, but Josh is one of the rock stars of cybersecurity, and I consider him a kindred spirit and a personal friend. Josh is currently a senior advisor at CISA, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Agency. And thank you, Josh, for your government service. Uh, Josh is also a co-founder of I Am the Calvary, which is where I first met Josh a number of years ago. In fact, we've been discussing eight bomb, S bombs there for uh, over eight years now. But I was actually quoting Josh, Josh's work many years before I'd actually met him. In almost every talk I've ever given since I heard this quote, I've been quoting the Rugged Manifesto. Um, where he says, I recognize that my code will be attacked by talented and persistent adversaries. He wrote that in 2008. I've been quoting it since around 2010. And when I was quoting it in 2010, people looked at me like I was wearing a tinfoil hat. But now in 2021, everyone looks at it and says, duh, of course. All right. Uh, hopefully we're almost to the duh, of course, on SBOMs. Um, and I've asked Josh to you know, go back through some of the things he said over the years and help us understand his prophecies and the underlying observations that led him to be so prophetic. Um, in cyber, TTP or tactics, techniques, and procedures, Josh is going to talk to us, take TTP to a higher plane, and he'll be speaking on trust, transparency, and proportionality. Josh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go really fast. I hope your energy is high. This is the uncoveted position in the afternoon. So uh, buckle up. Um, luckily, it's recorded if you have to go back. And I should uh, caveat that um, since quite a bit of the content here predates my one year of emergency service for running the pandemic here at CISA, uh, much of the content may not reflect the opinions of CISA or the federal government. There is a chunk where I'll make it a little clearer where we're talking about during the situ of the pandemic. Um, so I'm going to go fast. Let's let's do this. Um, I'm trusting Duncan's idea here too. All right. Um, so you'll see this guy again, but does anybody know who this is? Rhetorical question, but does anyone know know who or what this is? Because it's not just about trust, transparency, proportionality. It's also about time and timeliness. All right, so William Gibson, great quote, the future is already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. And SBOM and other things are here already, they're just not evenly distributed. And I would like to appeal to the leadership class that's listening to the Borderless Security Conference to help us usher that future in sooner. Um, so the cavalry real fast is just about a thousand or more uh, volunteer hackers trying to save lives through security research. We say it's wherever bits and bytes meet flesh and blood. And the problem statement was really that our dependence on connected technology was growing much faster than our ability to secure it in areas affecting public safety uh, and human life. And we just wanted to be a, a voice of reason and technical literacy, volunteerism to build trust with regulators uh, and producers of digital infrastructure. So I Am the Cavalry is a personal attestation that you might make. And it's somewhere in the middle of my journey that Duncan was hinting at. But one of the key parts here is not just to be safer, we're eventually gonna figure this out, it's to be safer sooner, it's to be left of boom. It's to make sure we're as prepared as possible before things get really, really bad. And I'm not sure we're actually succeeding. So this tried to draw about upon the, the white hat hackers, right? Hacking is magic. It's not good or bad. There are plenty of hackers that want to uh, use their, their skills to fight evil. Uh, you have to have Gandalf and, and uh, Harry and Hermione to, uh, to fight off the bad wizards, right? So the cavalry tended to attract the protectors and the puzzlers, those that do it to make the world safer and those that do it for challenge and curiosity. I suspect Duncan's a bit of both. Um, a loose agenda, since I'm peppering this with some RSA talks and some other things, is let's just talk about context and inflection points, some of the warning signs, how things got much worse during this last year during the pandemic, and where we got to go from here. So one of the things I like to use my testimonies for the cavalry is this line. It's heavy, but you can look at it more later. But I'm very much an influence uh, influenced by Dan Gear. And I really looked at this as the proportion of dependence and dependability. If we're over dependent on undependable things, we allow any accident or adversary to have a significant and asymmetric impact on public safety, human life. And uh, people didn't quite get this, but they're really getting it now. So that if you're over dependent on undependable things, you have a fork. You can make those things more dependable, which takes time and hard work and uncomfortable investments, or you can depend upon them less or both, but it's about proportionality. 
Now, this is also a picture we're going to get back to about six times at least, uh, but does anyone know what this picture is? Go ahead and put it in the chat if you do. Uh, it's pretty foundational to how we thought about things with I Am The Cavalry. So I told you I'd jump around a bit. Uh, Sunil Yu, um, fairly brilliant guy, and I did a talk about a CISA project we did. Uh, so this will be an example of where I am speaking uh, with just a uh, hat on, where we drew upon some previous things. But really what he said is, Josh, you started this rugged software idea that um, where the, the act of writing software and digital infrastructure was an awesome responsibility. Later, it found footing in dev, rugged DevOps, which was the whole Gene Kim Phoenix Project tribe. I also did this thing where I'm going to show you in a moment about zombie apocalypse and what's the most important thing for surviving a zombie apocalypse. And it's not usually cybersecurity. It's how defensible our IT and infrastructure is or isn't, uh, which led me to later when things started looking really serious for my and the cavalry almost eight years ago on August 1st. And when Dar Director Krebs called me during the pandemic last year and said, will you come serve your country for a year, uh, tried to take some of that cavalry spirit and urgency into running the pandemic as a CARES Act hire for the last 11 months. I've got four weeks left. So the zombies, um, if you're being chased through an open field by hordes of the undead who want to eat your brains, which of these two structures should you run toward? And what I was trying to do is make a food guide pyramid, an order of operations, a proportionality claim about where we should invest if we want to have defensible, resilient infrastructure. I hope you would choose the brick building. So the single most important factor for surviving the zombie apocalypse is do you have defensible infrastructure? Are you in a dilapidated wooden barn or a more defensible brick and mortar structure? This is the idea of rugged software. The second most important survival tactic for the night isn't security either. It's operational excellence. Do you know what you have? Do you know when it changes? Do you tolerate zero unplanned changes. This is Gene Kim 101 visible ops from his work at CMU studying the top performing IT organizations. So it's, do you have defensible infrastructure that's well operated with discipline? The third most important thing starts to get into cybersecurity. It's situational awareness. Are you fighting in the dark? Are you fighting blindly and dying quickly? Do you know who's attacking from which direction? Is it zombies or werewolves or vampires? Because you need different tools for different jobs. And do you know who's attacking your other friends across town so you can get threat intelligence uh, to understand where to uh, apply your precious resources? And then lastly, you want to deploy those brittle, expensive, ineffective countermeasures like wooden stakes or crowbars or silver bullets and the like. Now, in the cybersecurity realm, our sphere of influence tends to be up the tippy top. So we, we focus on the empty calories, not the important ones. And I want you to take a quick picture of these colors here, because I'm going to push them off to the side and then say, point out something that was wrong with the industry about eight years ago and still not quite fixed. So you really want to have more of your investment on defensible infrastructure. You want to do operational excellence next. And what I found when I mapped the RSA conference catalog and subsequently the DEF CON catalog that year is I made a little dot for every talk. And most things were focused on highly replaceable credit cards and nothing on human life. Most things were focused on brittle countermeasures and almost nothing on procuring and managing IT well. So why is that? Well, it's our sphere of control, our sphere of influence, and we don't have great relationships with our software builders, our IT operators, and that is part of our problem. So this year at RSA, Sudil and I said, how do we fix this? Because if you skip defensible infrastructure, we are all fighting bravely and dying quickly. So what are the things that may go into defensible infrastructure? Well, they're gonna be things like reduce attack complexity, reduce attack surface, trust boundaries, least privilege, not magic incantations of the phrase zero trust, but actually putting work into system design. And some of these things you've heard a lot about last last uh, 24, 48 hours include things like software bill and materials. Are we having defensible, maintainable, resilient, and transparent software to defend in the first place? Or is it chock full of holes? Is it that brick building or the dilapidated wooden barn? So you're often left with a choice. Um, the poorer a job you do on defensible, if you have indefensible infrastructure, you're going to have to make up for it with tons and tons of countermeasures and brittle things, and we're gonna have a lot of buildings on fire as we have had recently. So the opposite of situational blindness and situational awareness. 
So we have choices to make. And right now we're spending all of our time and energy on the wrong things. And I think it's the uh, open source community and the borderless security community and some of these initiatives in more defensible, resilient, maintainable code that will be the difference maker. Second talk from RSA this year, abrupt change, was with Chris Weisselp when we talked about the rising importance of chief product security officers. But I took a moment to talk about trust. And this was right about when the executive order was coming out, which we will get to. But I said, where is the trustworthy computing memo for critical infrastructure, right? Bill Gates did not say, here's a project when technology implementation, he made a value statement. He said, if we don't take security seriously, we're gonna lose all our business. So you have the choice between a new feature or fixing a security bug, fix a security bug. This was hot on the heels of a saturation point of enough failures with things like Melissa and I love you and other email-based um, infections. So I said, where's the pathos for software engineering? Now, Duncan's gonna smile because um, we have some, right? There are some who consider themselves actual engineers and understand the impo awesome importance of engineering. But what's the general pathos for the people coming straight out of school or going to work for the Facebooks or the, the Googles of the world right now? Well, in lieu of having a Hippocratic oath for connected medical devices, or if they haven't read our, our, our version, it's move facts and break things, which may actually even break democracies. It's this, this gem. If you're not embarrassed by your code, the first version of the product didn't launch too late. Now picture if that was the pathos of the people building our bridges and our skyscrapers. If you're not embarrassed by your riveting the day you open the bridge, you waited too long. And software, like it or not, has become infrastructure. We depend on software as much as we depend on steel and concrete. We need it to be more trustworthy. We've placed our trust there. That trust is not well-founded. So I tempted this way too long ago and not enough people understood it at the time. And I think still the case, and this may be too hard to read, but just Google it later. It's like 10 lines, I think. But you know, I, I think one of the key parts here is I recognize my code will be used in ways I cannot anticipate in ways it was not designed and for longer than ever intended. And I smiled ear to ear when Cassie mentioned that yesterday she worked on the early Microsoft Paint code and had no idea how long it would last, right? And hopefully Microsoft Paint isn't gonna kill anybody, but quite a few of these open source projects are in places that could lead to a loss of life. So think about this for a moment. I'm gonna take a breath, look at the roof, think about the drive you had you know, to, over a bridge recently. None of you sat in perpetual fear that the tunnel was gonna collapse upon you. None of you are worried right now that your building is gonna collapse. We have infrastructure, it is trustworthy because we have invested in institutional trust and the system of controls to make sure we're using defensible building materials, we're building to code, we have things inspected, we are able to take them for granted. They are nearly invisible. Software is becoming as foundational, but we are not nearly as ready for that awesome responsibility. And I think I'm preaching to the choir here, and I'm hoping that you can pick up the mission and preach to others, because we do not have enough of us thinking this way. So one of my co-authors of that, David Rice, uh, he says, the problem is we can't decide if, if uh, software engineering is art or if it's engineering, and we kind of capriciously choose one or the other. And it's a little bit of both, right? We say, throw some paint on the canvas, just get the minimum viable product out, we'll figure it out later. That's the artistic part. But we forget that sometimes there's very heavy consequences to national critical functions, to the delivery of patient care, to water treatment facilities. So what are the warning signs and the warnings? Um, back to this, when we first launched I Am The Cavalry, this is the Cuyahoga River in Ohio. This is approximately the site of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And when I launched it, uh, Andrew Matwishin, law professor and day one advocate and advisor of tough love said, Josh, no one's gonna listen to you until people die. I said, okay, well, we'll be ready for them when they do. And she said, You're, it's not, I said, I suspect we're gonna need like a, you know, the first proven death before people actually take this seriously. She said, actually, I think it's gonna be more like the Cuyahoga River. So this river in Ohio caught on fire from the pollution. How do you put out a burning river? But that's not the sad story. It's not that it caught on fire for this photo that ultimately catalyzed political will and led to the Clean Water Act and the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency. It caught on fire not once, not twice, not three times, but I believe it was 23 times across 70 years, burning down bridges, doing property damage to factories on the riverbanks. People just tolerated it until they didn't. So she said, you will need a series of cyber fires 
and eventually one will tip the consciousness. So a couple of years ago, we started to see these fires manifest. We knew that you could hack the power grids for 25 years. Putin proved it in Ukraine twice. We knew that industrial control systems were often directly connected to the internet on tools that you could search with like Shodan or census.io. And sure enough, the DOJ unsealed documents a few years back saying Iranians successfully opened a water facility, a water slough, a dam. There was no water in it, and at most it would have flooded a golf course. But it shows that you can reach out and touch someone from halfway across the world because we're just taking too many risks with connected technology. Right before uh, a congressional task force kicked off for healthcare industry cybersecurity in spring of 2016, a Hollywood Presbyterian hospital got hit by ransomware called SamSam that took advantage of a single Java deserialization flaw and a single Java library called JBoss and a single technology, and the whole hospital went down for a week, diverted ambulances up the street in LA traffic, canceled surgeries, and ultimately had to move critical care patients. Now that's one hospital, perhaps you think that that's no big deal, it was an accident, they weren't targeting hospitals, but the first thing I said is, oh no, if an accident can take out a hospital, a single hospital, what could Trick do? Well, who's Trick? Trick was a kid from Anonymous, he was a UK born Birmingham honor student who joined Team Poison, an anonymous splinter group, hacked Tony Blair's website, and while in prison, radicalized, joined ISIS, and upon getting out, moved his wife and child to Raqqa, Syria, where he was the founder of the Cyber Caliphate, to recruit and train people to attack the infidels. Uh, there's a documentary on the life of death of Trick, and it's pretty chilling because while he wasn't very talented, he had the means, motive, and opportunity to inflict harm on U.S. folks. And when he was killed with a drone strike as number four in the U.S. kill list, um, it was essentially the first time we had to take action on a hacker as allied forces. It's chilling that anyone on the internet can reach out and hurt someone uh, because we've made it way too easy. So when I saw Hollywood Presbyterian, I wasn't concerned about a single accidental attack. I said, what could Trick do to all U.S. hospitals? And shortly after this, hospitals went from obscure to the number one target of ransomware worldwide for the next 12 months or so. And my concern wasn't that this would happen, it's that when it happened, it would be like the BP oil spill and that we wouldn't have the ability to stop the bleeding or to stop the gushing in the Gulf day after day after day, because the response would be protracted because we simply haven't invested in countermeasures or recovery. While we were talking about this, the Mirai botnet showed you that cheap IoT cameras harnessed together could make a tsunami of DDoS attack that took out the internet on the eastern seaboard just before the US presidential election in 2016. And it showed that these cheap IoT devices, if they don't have good cyber hygiene, if they aren't defensible, if they have hard coded passwords, if they're not patchable, if they too are indefensible, even unimportant devices can do collective harm. Now, we finished up our healthcare industry cybersecurity task force, took uh, a couple of years off my life. Uh, but just as we were publishing to Congress brought Mother's Day, almost exactly four years ago, um, this was our headline. Healthcare cybersecurity is in critical condition. We identified several seams and stresses and cracks, but chief among them is that 85% of the hospitals lacked a single security person on staff. They're trying to defend indefensible old things like Windows XP. They're prematurely overconnected and reachable by the outside world. Single flaw in a single device can take out a whole hospital like we saw with Hollywood Presbyterian, but in a few days later, we were gonna see something much worse. And a typical device had a thousand or more known vulnerabilities. This led me to push pretty hard in the recommendations for something saying all medical technology should have a software bill of materials. Again, all medical technology should have a software bill of materials of all the third-party open source libraries, such that if there is an attack against, say a JBoss library, hospitals can very quickly tell, am I affected? and where am I affected? So this ultimately led to some uncomfortable conversations and they said, well, we can't afford security. We can't afford to hire people. We can barely afford to buy another ambulance. And I said, well, maybe if you can't protect it, you can't connect it. And that was too flippant, of course. So I channeled my inner Stan Lee to say with great connectivity comes great responsibility, but we have not really revealed the true costs. And as the ink was drying, WannaCry proved our worst nightmares and a couple of days later. Uh, it affected 40% of UK healthcare delivery. The US got very, very lucky. 
but uh, there was no stroke trauma centers open in the city of London for the whole weekend. So just take the number of likely stroke patients. It takes about three to four hours before you lose brain and lose life. There were casualties, whether we'll ever admit it or not. So this is not funny. Uh, and again, the U.S. got lucky a few weeks later, even though it wasn't intending to hit the U.S. at all, and certainly not to hit U.S. hospitals, not Petia also did damage to U.S. hospitals and canceled procedures and shut things down. And one accidental impact did over a billion dollars to a pharmaceutical company in the U.S., a $10 billion total in counting. So what does this have to do with software and transparency and trustworthiness? And what, certainly what does it have to do with marathons? Really quickly, and we're going to see this again in a few minutes. There was also a seminal piece of research done that caught my attention and my teammates and I am the cavalry. It's that if you have a heart attack during a U.S. marathon, you're more likely to be dead in 30 days. It basically found that in a longitudinal study in the New England Journal of Medicine, that the 4.4 minute longer ambulance ride led to a statistically higher mortality rate 30 days later. So degraded and delayed patient care for a marathon or for any other cause can affect mortality rates for time sensitive conditions. So what we decided to do instead of waiting for harm is we did the world's first ER hacking simulations called the CyberMed Summit. We wanted to see could hacking could ransoms, could manipulation of devices lead to patient harm and patient death? So ABC Nightline came in, we filmed everything. We did three hacking simulations of actual hacks on devices with actual impact on human physiology to see if the ER docs could actually save the patient. All three patients died. No one knew what was coming. We did tabletop exercises on a documentary called Fear of Hackers. And ultimately what we tried to test was assumptions to see if healthcare was ready for a mass scale attack like not, not Petia or like WannaCry? And the answer was no. And we continue to do these exercises on mass and have been trying to bring them into the federal government more recently. So if all this was pre-pandemic, what happened in the last several months, last year plus? So this is a good news story, but with a bad news graphic. Um, I'm gonna situate us that we lost a lot of Americans and a lot of loved ones worldwide to the pandemic. We also lost a lot of people not depicted here due to degraded and delayed patient care due to very weak cyber infrastructure and other factors. So well, this is graphic is trying to show you the unfathomable told. Perhaps you remember that somber milestone in February of this year when the U.S. declared that we had hit the 500,000 dead Americans due to COVID. What was not captured there was in the same time period, we lost another 150,000. This is the CDC excess death data. It's opendata.gov. This showed about 150,000 other Americans who died from non-COVID. And the excess death is the difference between expected deaths and actual deaths. And these were conditions like heart attacks, like strokes. These were treatable conditions that did not get timely patient care. The overwhelming majority of the delays came from people being afraid to go to a hospital as we tried to flatten the curve or who couldn't get in when they did try because there were no beds left or there weren't sufficient beds or nurses or doctors. So we had um, a pretty heavy hit to our population and the number one age demographic for that 150,000 excess deaths in the same period of by February were aged 25 to 44. So these were young frontline workers. They weren't uh, elderly people that were likely to die anyhow. So this was pretty sobering to me. And of course I wanted to lean in a little bit more because if degraded and delayed patient care can affect mortality, if 4.4 minutes is enough between, to be the light between life and death for a heart attack and one to four hours is the difference between life and death for a stroke, what do you think happened when we had four weeks of no patient care in the University of Vermont Medical Center? And it's 118 facilities across upstate New York, Vermont and New Hampshire. Hospitals cannot be down for an hour, for a day, for a week, but certainly not for 28 straight days. And absolutely not during a pandemic when care is already limited and we're already seeing such excess deaths from the pandemic. This is not okay. This is a Cuyahoga River on fire. We need to trust that the water that comes out of our faucets is drinkable and has not been poisoned with excessive levels of lye. And yet, adversaries routinely, another revealed this week in California, are able to log in using very little effort and affect the quality and integrity of our water. Another fire. Our food supply is critical. 
as we've over consolidated in the global market and one of the top meat suppliers can be compromised electronically through weak software. Another fire. Our fuel supply for civilian or military use for the eastern seaboard for far too long a period disrupted through electronic means. Fire. Even federal agencies are facing a scourge of attacks from a bevy of accidents and adversaries. The fires have come, the fires have tipped consciousness. It's not okay anymore. And I'm gonna need you to be your best. So we have had some fires. We've said for a while that transparency is coming. We've said for a while, SBOM is coming. SBOM is here. You've heard about it a lot. SBOM not the only piece, but it is a central piece in driving up transparency and trustworthiness. Uh, in President Biden's executive order on improving cybersecurity, I'm going to read you one of my favorite lines. In the end, the trust we place in our digital infrastructure should be proportional to how trustworthy and transparent that infrastructure is and to the consequences we will incur if that trust is misplaced. As the world increasingly depends on software, it increasingly depends on you. What are you going to do about it? We can't keep hand-waving about best practices. They aren't anymore. In fact, I'm pleased to say today we put out around one o'clock a new site at cisa.gov slash bad practices to call out some of the most dangerous anti-patterns that need our attention, especially in service of critical infrastructure. Good enough security isn't. Maybe it never was. I think what we had is we were prone and we were prey. We lacked sufficient predator appetite. They are more active, they are more brazen, and it's gonna get worse before it gets better. It's gonna take courage. Yes, things are gonna be hard. Yes, we may have some dirty laundry in our SBOMs. Yes, it may take some front-end investment. And it's necessary. As the world increasingly depends on connected technology, that technology needs to be dependable, defensible, trustworthy, transparent, maintainable. So one of the things I'm bullish on and have been for some time is the SBOM concept. Blink and you'll miss it. But this is uh, the project that's been going on for me as a labor lover for over eight years under that name, a little longer before that. I think Duncan's been a fellow uh, advocate in his own path and journey, and we found each other. Uh, in the last three years, more specifically through the NTA volunteer process, but it almost uh, actually had a bill in 2014, right around the time of Heartbleed, Cyber, Cyber Supply Chain Management and Transparency Act of 2014. Industry hated it, and it died in a fire. But then when it made its way into um, medical device requirements for the FDA after a task force report, then NTA and the Commerce Department and private sector said, let's at least have a common standard of voluntary best practices so that we don't have an accidental de facto standard for healthcare that doesn't apply to elsewhere. I want to remind people, because we've all forgotten when we're saying how hard this is and whether or not it's worth it. And on all the FUD I'm hearing from the haters, this was not invented in cybersecurity. It was invented by Deming and Toyota in the 40s. And it was not invented to make more secure cars from hacking. It was made, it was invented to make more profitable, higher quality cars. And it helped Toyota dominate manufacturing for 10, 20, 30 years. And ogle this chart later if you like, but uh, Toyota Prius uh, had a sixth of the suppliers. In theory, that means they were making more of their own products, but they had a fraction of the manufacturing costs and much more commercial success and much more profit. So 12 times the sales for 60% of the price for the six of the suppliers. And some of those principles that I like to, the trinity of principles that I was trying to steal from Deming as we put this into SBOM is number one, use fewer and better suppliers of parts. Number two, use the highest quality parts from those superior suppliers. And number three, track which parts go where throughout manufacturing through a bill of materials such that when something goes wrong, you can do a prompt and agile and targeted recall. So fewer, better suppliers of open source, higher quality, less vulnerable versions of those open source libraries at the time of production and know which things go where so we can have prompt and agile recovery if there's a flaw or a CVE or something of the like. And as Cassie reminded me yesterday in her great talk about the millions and millions of lines of code, the other philosopher I like to quote here is Biggie Smalls, more money, more problems, more code, more problems. And I think one of the things we've been lulled into is with code being so free and accessible, we'll use a massive, several 
million lines of code for maybe a random number generator fe feature or function. So we have allowed code bloat, elective attack surface, elective complexity. And yes, there's going to be a lot of vulnerabilities in there, but it doesn't have to be that way. And I think the act of measuring alters the, uh, the what is it? Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is the act of observation affects the observed. I'm hoping that the act of transparency reveals to us, wow, we've got some old stuff in there. Wow, we don't need four versions of Spring in the same uh, distribution. Wow, we can get rid of tons of this elective attack surface if we simply refresh or prune out the things we don't really need. So some of the canonical graphics we're gonna, that maybe you have seen or maybe you haven't, uh, Audra and is my co-chair on the NTI working group. And we made this graphic, which says this bedside infusion pump is sold into lots of hospitals and operational environments, but it, it has a supply chain. It's supply chain has a supply chain. Those compound parts could be plural levels deep, but we're basically all in a supply chain. Most of us are in the middle and a flaw anywhere down in the bowels of this flow could affect healthcare and hospitals. It may not just be that device that open source library deep in the bowels, those atomic parts might also affect your desktop or your electronic health records. So it's critically important that we know where our food comes from and if there's anything poisonous in it so we can take action. And each of those is also gonna have trust levels. And if you really wanna, you know, this is something we, why Sopo and I talked about, depends on how rigorous you wanna get. SPOM is merely asking for that chain, but not necessarily how trustworthy individual projects are. So this baseline stuff you can look up later, uh, but this is not asking for a ton. People say, this is hard, this is impossible. You can't make a Java build without knowing these things. When you build it in Jenkins, take a receipt in this SPDX format as a free plugin. People are saying how impossible this is, how hard this is. Going back in time would be hard, but these things are available at the time of build and creation. It could be a free and frictionless byproduct of making new code. So don't listen to the haters. Let's figure out how to roll up our sleeves and lean in. There's a great graphic uh, our adoption awareness group uh, made with Audra. This initial consensus helps you see it. Look at this in your own time. All of these graphics can be found at ntia.gov slash SBOM. We're trying to make this easier. And if the question of depth comes up, I've heard this recently, oh, it's too hard. Maybe we should just do one hop of dependencies. Let me remind you that one hop of dependencies is probably under 10% of the total number of components. And most of the use cases like Urgent 11, like uh, Ripple 20, tended to be two or three or four hops down in the dependency graph. And you would actually have to do ad additional work for net new code to, to limit how much visibility you have, because as you build this software package, you can't do it without knowing all the dependencies. So we really wanna make sure that we're leaning in and we're not doing this so slowly that we undermine the potential benefits. So again, the SBOM is this green column, it's just what's in it. There were a lot of debate yesterday about should you have vulnerability data in it? I'm squarely in the hell no camp. We should have a static evergreen list of what's in it is that column and that can be used to look up a dynamic and growing and ever changing list of vulnerabilities as well as that concept of vulnerability exploitability, which is really column three of some form of attestation across stakeholders in time. Most of these materials and others are posted at uh, nti.gov slash SBOM and lots of dedicated people have spent three years on this or prior to the eight years ago that others and, and longer had started it. So back to the river on fire. Um, I don't think the fires are gonna stop folks. Um, adversaries have gotten quite brazen. Uh, they're taking bigger targets all the time. The ransoms are getting larger. They're realizing we are target rich and resource poor. So I can't stop the natural disaster at the moment. And the whole of government is asking how we might turn the tide. What I can say is let's take a lesson from the earthquakes in Haiti. You might remember in 2010, January, uh, we lost 230,000 from our planet in the Haitian earthquakes. It was a 7.0 Richter scale. What no one heard about, because there was no humanitarian relief for, is a much stronger earthquake in Chile a few weeks later that killed very few people. So why did an 8.8 .8 Richter scale kill so many fewer people? Well, upon studying it with all the civil engineers, uh, correcting for all other variables, it was basically building codes. Chile had them, Haiti didn't. So the earthquakes existed. The earthquakes were stronger in Chile, but the, the buildings could take it. So it wasn't the presence of earthquakes or the magnitude of earthquakes. It was insufficient building codes. It was indefensible infrastructure. So maybe I can't change the volume and variety of ransoms or even the magnitude of the ransoms, 
But what we can try to do is make more defensible, resilient, maintainable digital infrastructure in support of critical infrastructure. So if anybody feels like they got the answer for who this is, this is uh, Semmelweis. Uh, he was considered a heretic. No one listened to him for about 100 years that maybe you should wash your hands before doing surgery or performing childbirth. And our post-op, post-birth mortality rates were through the roof when people didn't understand they should wash their hands. Doctors are precious resources. Soap is not free. ORs are very finite resources. So yes, it costs money. It takes time to scrub in. And this, this revolution of scrubbing in before surgery, hygiene saved countless lives. And it unfortunately took us about a hundred years to take his advice. I hope it does not take us a hundred years to do the right thing here. Because again, our overdependence on undependable things exposes us to too many accidents and adversaries. And that threat is manifest on the nightly news. So uh, the solution is you. Uh, I wanna know what you're willing and able to do, whether you're gonna participate through something like I'm the Cavalry, or you're just gonna feel a fire in your heart to be part of that solution. Uh, it's not gonna come on its own. It takes volunteers rolling up their sleeves, pushing back on the fear, pushing through the FUD, and making sure that we build the future. You know, We get the democracy we deserve, we get the infrastructure we invest in, you get the house you build, Let's build the right one. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. That was wonderful. Um, I, that was really great. Um, act, we actually do have, um, did cover a lot, but we still do have a couple of minutes left. Um, oh, that's warning me, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, I used the uh, foil hats and the, the tinfoil hats and the dove course earlier. Um, I know you've used the five stages of grief before. Could you talk a little bit about the five stages of grief? You're going to laugh. I actually prepared thinking you were going to corner me. So this is just a randomly grabbed five stages of grief. Uh, we do not have it finished, but we've started making one for the five stages of S-bomb grief. There's little debate because the newer one has more than five stages. But if you understand denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance, we have quite a bit of anger and bargaining right now. Like, should it be one, just one level deep? Should we, can we maybe have fewer pieces of info? What if we, you know, this is a roadmap to the attacker. And I'm not trying to be flippant or dismissive of sincere concerns, but we also have insincere and dishonest concerns for people that are trying to hide or buy time or water this down in a way that I think works counter to our collective public interest. So I think we're entering somewhere between these stages, but usually it's, uh, I have great code. I do good testing. So let's call that the denial stage. We have this false sense of security that we're doing a good job or that open source is immune to flaws because many eyeballs, all bugs are shallow, things like that. When you start pointing out, there's a ton of known vulnerabilities in the code. When you start shining a light, people get angry, they get indignant. They start saying, well, most of those aren't exploitable. Well, I just want to remind you, if the average medical device had over a thousand known CVEs in it, uh, even a very small percentage of a very large number is a large number. And it only takes one to take out a hospital or to let a water facility get hacked or oil and gas pipeline. So then the bargaining comes, which is, okay, okay, we can do this, but like, can we share the least amount possible? Or can we do it later? Or what about just for new code instead of for old code? And that's kind of where a lot of people are right now as people try to define minimums and through the end of the month here. And uh, uh, Alan, who's presented yesterday, has the unenviable task of defining the president's minimum SBOM uh, any day now. So the comment period came in and I read some of them. And boy, is there a lot of bargaining in some of those comments. Um, and then comes, you know, whatever gets determined, we're going to have to adapt to it. Uh, if you want to sell to the federal government, you're going to need to be transparent and trustworthy. And that visibility is going to be hard. I think the really interesting part is going to come after that, which is going to be really good things. I think initially you're going to say, wow, I didn't know I was using all that stuff. Um, and then you're going to say, do I need all that stuff? Or how do I fix, you know, 350 CVEs? And then we're going to realize like Rob Suarez did at Beckton Dickinson is he spent a weekend with a team and they updated, they leaned into it. They found that updating seven libraries got rid of almost all their vulnerabilities. So 80-20 rule, you know, the shock and awe and the depression and overwhelmed that all you're going to do is be fixing bugs. You're going to realize someone already fixed the bugs for you. It's already fixed in a newer version. 
So this really just becomes about coming to terms and doing the work. Um, one way I put this is uh, I think a lot of folks are in the depression stage. You know, I'm a Marvel fan. Uh, but once you start doing the work, I think it's going to lead to things like we're not going to use as many libraries. We're not going to use huge projects just for random number generation. We're going to use smaller, better maintained projects. Uh, we're going to make sure that the software we use is worth it. We're going to make sure we pick libraries that are better maintained and have a better track record for hygiene. And we're going to shift away from vendors that won't give us the transparency we deserve. So once we're past the depression, you know, the slightly newer Kubler Glass model says there's a couple other stages in there about figuring things out and doing experimentation. And the good news is, since the future is here already, it's just not evenly distributed. We do think that uh, you can learn quite a bit from the people that have already done it and benefit from some network effect. The, the claim that no one has time to test all those vulnerabilities, we don't need you to test all the vulnerabilities. Once one in the network figures out if it's exploitable or not, the whole network gets smarter. So there's a lot of assumptions about how hard this will be. It has not proven to be so in financial services. So let me just end, I guess, with one more Marvel string, because I'm a big Marvel fan, as you can tell. Uh, I think early on, before we had the skill or the strength, you know, we were still fight fighting this to make more defensible resilient infrastructure. And perhaps this was you earlier in your career. At some point, we got formidable. We got our superpowers, and we could fight bigger foes like Red Skull. Unfortunately, the last couple of years have been fighting our friends in a civil war, right? Friendly fire. It's kind of exhausting, but you got to keep your head in the game because the world's depending on us. Because ultimately, we're going to fight the end game. And we're going to have bigger foes with higher stakes. And I think we're here, folks. So I'm asking you to be heroic and get step up, stand up, push harder so we can assemble and push back and have more defensible, resilient, maintainable digital infrastructure. Critical infrastructure is too critical to leave to chance. I'm counting on you. Thank you, Josh. That was absolutely great. And uh, with that, we will conclude because we're, uh, I think we have a fairly short break and then the uh, next and final set of speakers are up. So thank you again, and we'll see you all in the next, uh, in the next room in a couple of minutes. Thanks.